this is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicles, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Stories of the Supernatural. Wherever you find us, whether it's a video or podcast on your favorite platform, please like and subscribe to us so that you can get notification of when a new show is released. You can also find us on major social media platforms. If you go to MiamiGhostChronicles.com, you can find links to the videos or MP3 files, which you can download and enjoy without commercial interruptions. If you're into classic horror, ghost, and adventure stories, I narrate Nightshade Diary, and you can find links at NightshadeDiary.com. If scary stories are your bag, and listening to encounters with cryptids, ghosts, dogmen, and other weird creatures sends a shiver up your spine, then go to SupernaturalStoryTime.com for links to our weekly podcasts. Noteworthy news about the paranormal world, true crime, conspiracy stories, and anything that is just plain weird can be found at eerie.news or visit the Stranger Than Fiction Stories tab at MiamiGhostChronicles.com. Please subscribe to my newsletter on Substack. Just go to mppelliser.com for a link. I want to thank you for being part of my audience, and I think you are all wonderful. Wonderful. I cut off short. I don't know why I did that. Anyway, guys, how are, how's everybody doing? Good. I'm good. Hot. Like every place else. But you know what? When you're born and raised in Florida, especially South Florida, which has got a subtropical climate, you can withstand it. <laughs> I mean, when you grow up uh, in a place where it's hot and humid about, what, 90% of the year? Like I said before, I had plenty of Christmases where it was in the 80s. It was, let's face it, if the temperature dripped into the 60s in December, January, like, yay, it's cold, which it really wasn't. But yeah, but uh, but of course, you know, now it's hot and humid. And But yeah, I'm tolerating it very well. Not very well. I take that back. Pretty well. Pretty well. Yeah, pretty well. Um, you know, and before you know it, you know, we'll be we'll be at uh, during we'll be doing the holidays all over again because that's the way time flies when you're having fun and even when you're not. But besides that, you know, what's that other saying? No news is good news. So, yeah, everything is uh, pretty much the same here. I know I've had people ask me about how are my are animals doing my farm animals? They're all doing well. I just discovered um I had one lone guinea. I, I'm raising about 18 others, but they're still chicks. And I had one guinea, which was saved. What One of those, my stories. And she, uh, a couple of, well, no, I take that back. About a week ago, she was missing. I was like, oh my God, I don't, I don't want to have lost her to a, a predator. The other day I chased something out of my chicken coop. I couldn't get a good look at it. But when I went out there, I saw it. And it triggered off my, my uh, motion detectors, you know, with the lights. But anyway. Then all of a sudden I heard her, there's, I've got like a little bunch of bushes out there and I hear her that call. Anybody that's familiar with guineas knows that they make like a weird, like, 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 like weird noise. So sure enough, I said, oh, she's on eggs. Sure enough, she's got about a dozen or so eggs. Thing is, there's no male guineas. The only thing she's been mating with are roosters. So I'm just dying to see what comes of that, of that combination. And I had read prior because I was curious that yes, that they're similar enough that that uh that they can produce live chicks but or keats which is well that's what they call guinea chicks keats so, let's see what comes up in a little frankenstein chicky keat i don't know but anyway let's get on to the good part and the good part is who we have as a guest today here in stories of the supernatural this is the first time this gentleman has been here and his name is garnet schulhauser he's a retired lawyer who lives near Victoria on Vancouver Island with his wife, Kathy. After practicing corporate law for over 30 years in Calgary with two blue chip law firms, he retired in 2008. And his first book, Dancing on a Stamp, was published in 2012. He is a level two quantum healing hypnosis technique practitioner, a modality that guides clients to experience past lives and connect with their higher selves. In Dancing on a Stamp, Garnett recounts how his life changed dramatically one day when he was confronted on the street by a homeless man named Albert, who was actually a wise spirit in disguise. This seemingly chance encounter launched a provocative dialogue with Albert, who disclosed startling new revelations about our true nature as eternal souls, the cycle of reincarnation on Earth, and the afterlife that awaits us all. Garnett's second book, Dancing Forever with Spirit, describes his next encounter with Albert, who guided him on a series of astral adventures. His third book, Dance of Heavenly Bliss, 
continues the saga of his astral trips with Albert, who took him to meet Gaia, the consciousness of Mother Earth. Garnet describes his more, more astral travels in his fourth book, Dance of Eternal Rapture, including encounters with Muhammad, Buddha, Mary Magdalene, and Jesus, and a journey to Earth in a parallel universe where there is much less violence and strife due to a couple of quirks in the history of the planet. In his fifth book, Dancing with Angels in Heaven, the author recalls a trip to the spirit side to observe an orientation class about planet Earth for souls planning to incarnate on our planet. Help me welcome him. How are you two doing today, Garnet? I'm doing just fine. Thank you, Marlene. How about you? Very good. Very good. Like I said, hot, but it's to be expected. I live in Florida. Mm. You, in your bio, here you are. You are an attorney. And I'm going to say it because I know that stereotypes, it's stereotypes, but you always think of attorneys as being very analytical. And um, in other words, based on fact, evidence, et cetera. When you retired, I mean, did you have an interest in this all along while you were an attorney or did did you have some type of event afterwards, your retirement? What happened? No, I, I wasn't interested in uh, in any of the spiritual um, aspects of of, uh, of our lives until basically until I met Albert. So Albert okay. is more than the introduction. Albert was a homeless man. So I was a typical corporate lawyer, stuffed shirt, buttoned down. Arrogant, condescending, you know, the whole trip. <laughs> okay. You can imagine that, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of attorneys are. That was me, totally. Type A personality. Uh, so this was, this was, okay, I see. You were, you were anything but that. Yeah, what people think yeah. of is, so, so, okay. So what happened, a major transformation in my life is when I met Albert. And what happened, you want me to tell you about Yes, that? of course, absolutely, yes. So I'm still practicing law and I'm strolling down the street one Sunday afternoon in May. Um, probably going to a meeting or whatever. And all of a sudden, a homeless man just jumps out in front of me, stops me right in my tracks. And I'd never seen this man before. Um, and he looked like a typical homeless man with, with long stringy hair and scraggly beard and dirty slept in clothes. And he smelled awful. Um, and so but typically when I, when I would run into these people before, I would just go around them quickly. <coughs> Excuse mm -hmm. me. But... This guy was different because he had these amazing, dazzling, sparkling blue eyes uh, okay. that were sending me what I felt like was just a wave, a gush of pure, unconditional love that was hitting me and infusing my whole body with an amazing sense of peace, and security, and well-being. I never felt this good before. Like, it was just an amazing feeling. It's just like, I almost thought that, did I die and go to heaven? I don't know what, you know, where is this all coming right. from? Um, so, so I stood there like a deer caught in the headlights. It was like a time warp. I had no idea you know, how long I was there or, or what was happening. Um, and then he broke the spell by saying to me, why are you here? Then he promptly disappeared into a nearby store. So when I finally collected my wits, okay. I decided I had to go into the store and find him, find out who he was. So I went into the store. There was only one entrance and exit. Uh, I went in there, nowhere to be seen in the store. And he, I hadn't seen him come out. So I went back out on the street and I walked up and down for several blocks, hoping to spot him, but he had disappeared in the thin air. Just, he was nowhere. So okay. that night I, so I walked back to my office that night. I resolved to go back the next day to see if I can find this guy. And so I did next day, same street, same time of day, hoping to find him. He wasn't seen initially. And I, I, I looked for about 15, 20 minutes going up and down the, that same street. I was about to give up hope. And then I spotted him sitting all alone on a bench. Okay. And so I went up to him and I said, who are you? And why did you stop me the other day? He said, I'm a soul just like you. I'm here to help you on your journey and answer your questions. Well, then my skeptical lawyer brain, and, and you, know, you mentioned before how lawyers tend to be analytical and skeptical. My skeptical uh -huh. lawyer brain kicked in and I said to him, why do you think you can help me when you can't even help yourself? Because it looks like you've been sleeping on the street for weeks. You haven't had a shower probably in months. And you smell like a dead fish. Well, he just cracked a big smile. And he said, you know, looks can be deceiving. Because it looks like you look like you're a successful lawyer with everything uh -huh. under control. But we both know that's just the facade. Oh, We know you've been asking the eternal questions of life for the last number of years. And you're searching for answers. And so... 
I've showed up in your life to try to give you the answers you've been searching for. He said, but you know, if you're not comfortable with this, turn around, go back to your office. Maybe you can find the answers you've been searching for and all those emails from your clients waiting for you on your computer. Well, oh my tuition was screaming at me to say, no, I'm not going to find any answers on my computer. And what I, the heck, what do I have to lose? I'll sit down and talk with this guy, lose a half an hour of my life. Not a big deal. So I did. And he told me uh, early on, he said uh, his name was Albert. And he was really one of my spirit guides in disguise. Um, and he said he had come to answer my question. So we we began a dialogue that, that started on this park bench and then uh, uh, when uh, a few more times he, he uh, manifested physically. And then after that, he was just a voice in my head and we communicated by telepathy. So when I, when I said to him, well, why did you show up disguised as this homeless man? And he said, well, if I had just suddenly out of the blue started talking to you as a voice in your head, you probably would have thought you're losing your mind. Sure. And I, I, I agree, I probably would have. So he said this was his way of easing me into the conversation because there... He was in flesh and blood. I could see him. I could feel him. I could touch him. Um, and, and and then when he started talking to me just by telepathy, I recognized the voice. I knew who he was. Um, th the interesting thing was he told me afterwards that I was the only one who could see him manifested as a homeless man. So if somebody had been wow. walking by the bench that day, he was, they, they would have seen me <laughs> he was sitting, sitting talking by myself, yourself. Talking to myself. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, and, and so and so that was that, that was that was the beginning of it. Um, so he answered all the big questions in life with 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 great truth and wisdom. Um, and then he told, he surprised me. He told me uh, early on in the in the dialogue that we had. He said, "I'm not just here to satisfy your curiosity. I want you to write a book about what I've revealed to you, so my revelations would be available to everyone." That really threw me on my bum because I had not, not even dreamed of writing a book. It was not anywhere in my radar screen at all. Um, so anyway, we, we carried on with this conversation. Then about a year after I met him, uh, practicing law just seemed to be so irrelevant uh, that I just, okay, time to quit. So I retired about a year later, uh, and, and I was in Calgary, moved out to Vancouver Island. And then Albert proceeded, and I, I sort of tried to ignore his, his, uh, his requests that I write a book. He wouldn't let me. He kept on very gently pushing me in that direction. And, uh, and he won. And I, I've since learned that there's no point in arguing with spirit. You know, eventually they're going to win. So you might as well just go with it. So with he, it. he convinced me to write the manuscript for my first book, Dancing on a Stamp, which contained all of his revelations, all the, the, the good stuff from our conversation. Um, then when I finished the manuscript, I, 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 had, I had a decision point. Like, should I just throw it in a drawer, never to be seen again? Should I get it published? My concern was that so many of my former law partners, clients, colleagues would think that uh, I'd oh, gone boy, crazy, yeah. you know, that I'd lost my mind. And I was afraid of that reaction because mm -hmm. because what, how they knew me as a lawyer was totally different from how I ended up being after sure. I met Albert. And so, but ultimately I, I made the right decision. I just said, well, to hell with it. If I don't do this, I'll regret it for the rest of my life. So I got it published. And there was some, some negative reaction. Some of my former partners and clients basically just ignored me, so I, you know, ghosted me. Uh, and they never <laughs> said to my face, we, we, we think you're crazy, Garnet. But I know they were thinking that. But that's okay. So I lost a few friends, but I gained a whole lot more new friends, spiritually minded people who understand what I was saying or what Albert was saying to me. And so it's been a very positive, overwhelmingly positive event in my life. And I, I've never regretted it, never looked back. Garnet, why do you think that your guy decided to take the form of a homeless man, considering they could have chosen anyway. Do you... Yeah, and I actually asked him that, Marlene. Okay. I said, why did you show up in that form? Because you, you could have showed up in a three-piece suit, you know? Mm -hmm. And he said it was a test. We wanted to see okay. if you could climb off your high horse and, and and actually sit down and talk with a with a grubby homeless man to see, you know, it was a test for me. And luckily I passed it because I did sit down and talk to the guy. Right. And I said to Albert, well, what if I hadn't sat, what if I hadn't talked to you that day? Would you have come back in another form? And he said, that's a hypothetical we don't need to answer. So he wouldn't tell <laughs> right. me that. Right, but, right, but exactly luckily, as you did. Luckily, right. I, did, I did sit down and talk to him. And that's, that, was, that was why he chose a homeless man as opposed to another lawyer or business person on the street. So, Let me ask you, that area where you encountered him, 
was that known for homeless people being around that area? Because you said I usually I would just go around yeah, them. Yeah, there, there, there wasn't a whole lot of homeless people. It was called mm-hmm. the Stephen Avenue Mall in Calgary, which was a pedestrian only street. So there's no vehicles, just people right. walking around it. And, and not a whole lot of homeless people, but there were some and they would okay. be panhandling for money and so on. And, sure. and of course, being arrogant and condescending. When I saw these homeless people, I think to myself, why don't you go get a job like the rest of us, you bum, and quit right. living on the streets? Exactly. You know, that was my attitude sure. until I met Albert. <laughs> and he switched right. that totally around. And now I look at homeless ah, people you. differently, for sure. It speaks a lot to that you actually were able, because most a lot of people that I know would have said, that first thing, either walk around the guy, forget it. I'm not about to talk to you, right? Yeah. And like you said, that you continue to look for him after you couldn't find him that first time. So yeah, think, and, that, uh, and that's and that's because he was so intriguing because because as I said he was his eyes were sending me this I can only describe it as unconditional love not not every homeless person or any person I ever met before could do that so I, I bet mean, he no was, he, he was a special person and I thought okay I've got to go and see who he is see if I can find him again find out who he was and what what makes him tick and and why did he stop me and so I found that out so let I me ask you how did my this affect got the your your family life because i know what you mean as far as colleagues and professionally how did your family receive that information when did you when you told them or did you know how well, you I, I was very uh, cautious about telling anyone i didn't even tell my wife about meeting albert until quite some time later because i was worried about mm-hmm. what she'd say but but eventually i slowly let it leak out that i you know i met this homeless man in the street and okay and he's actually one of my spirit guides and that was fine and he wants me to write a book and that was fine. So my, my wife is actually a very spiritually okay. oriented person. She's had a number of, of, of sort of paranormal encounters with spirits herself. So okay. she's fully in tune with that. So she had no problem with that. And, and my two sons, I, I didn't tell them too much later. And it was kind of like, you know, I'm writing a book and this is what it's about. And they were like, okay, dad, good for you. <laughs> so there <was laughs> That's no good. Yeah. There's no ways right. in my family, thankfully. Right, right. Because I know sometimes, especially... When a person starts to act totally different from what they're expected, like you said, yeah. they're like, "Okay, what's wrong? You know, is is there a physical or organic problem? What 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 is it? You know?" <laughs> so it speaks highly of your family. They were like, "Okay, sure, go ahead." Yeah, and and that um, it easier for me because there, there was nobody saying, "Oh, you're crazy, you gotta right. stop this," and you know, that decided to like fine. like look at you and go, "Okay, there's something going on here." Like, as in, there's something wrong, crazy kind of deal. That yeah. kind of thing, which is yeah. So, yeah, so I got, I got a good reception from my family, which really helped a lot. Of course. Um, and then you know we just carried on from there. So when you were writing this book, were there ever times that you stopped and said, "What am I doing?" <laughs> like that, you're like, you're like, oh, you know, because and, and it was writing a book in and of itself, you know, even when you're, I'm going to say, not even divinely inspired, it's 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 a task. Or were there times where you had doubts about, like, man, am I, what, what am I thinking of, or, or is, where is this That's leading? Many times, many times when I'm writing it, I would get partway through and I'll say, what am I doing here? You know, what, what, what's, yeah. what's, where's this going? Where, where am I going to, where's this going to take me? You know, but I just kept on pressing on, and I know that Albert kept on encouraging me. Uh, he's very persuasive, and 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 I really trusted Albert. So he says, he says, look, at, you need to write this book, and it's you need to finish it and publish it. So I sort of like, okay, I'm in your hands, Albert. And so I did, and I'm glad I did. Okay. And wh- I know that you also um, got into hypnosis and so on and so forth, in, in reincarnation. In other words, that we come back here. How did that equate? That Was he the one that introduced you to that idea that basically we come back and reincarnate? Or how was that? How, how did you discover yeah, yeah, that? Yeah, it was Albert who first, who first introduced me to the, the reality of the cycle of reincarnation about, you know, where we come from on the spirit side, you know, why we incarnate, uh, you know, what happens to you when we're, our bodies are dead, you know, the whole, the whole cycle explained it all very well. And it just made eminent sense to me. I mean, it was like, yeah, that, you know, that's, that's way better than what I was taught as a child, as a child, as a child, I was raised as a Roman Catholic. Mm-hmm. And I know what they said. They didn't, they don't believe in reincarnation. It's like you, you, God puts you in this life for whatever reason you have one life. And if you screw up, you go to hell. If you're good, you go to heaven. Right. Uh, it, but, you know, that's what I was t- taught as a child. But as I got older, my 20s and 30s, it was sort of like a lot of the things they taught me didn't make a lot of sense. And then Albert comes along and it's like, okay, he's really 
giving me the real goods. And it makes sense to me, sense to me with my lawyer brain that, yeah, this is how things work. So that's right. that's how I got introduced into the, the whole concept of who we are, souls, where we come from, and the, and the whole cycle of reincarnation. So the, the QHHT, interestingly, uh, that came up later. I had I had finished um, writing my fourth book, um, mm -hmm. and I said to Albert, what should I do now? Should I write book five, or what do you want me to do? And he said, I want you to take the QHHT course. Now, I was a bit familiar with this course because it was uh, uh, started and developed and perfected by Dolores Cannon. Yes. Um, uh, and Dolores Cannon was the owner of my publishing company that, who published my first four books. So okay. I had met Dolores Cannon. I had contact with her. I was vaguely familiar with the QHHT program. Didn't really interest me that much until Albert said, well, you should go do this. And so I took the course. I'm glad that he pushed me into it because that gave me a whole new sort of dimension of, of uh, the cycle of reincarnation and life. It also um, allowed me to uh, uh, help people one-on-one -on -one in a very direct fashion, which which I really enjoy doing. You know, I hope that my books help people, but it, it's hard to, unless they send me an email saying, I liked your book sure. or whatever, you don't really know how they react to it. Um, and so right. so this QHHT was actually a very nice modality for me to, to move into. Uh, and then after I had gotten going on that one, then he said, okay, time to write book five. So then I did. And uh, I'm still have you waiting. Have done any past life regression for yourself? You mean, have I been a subject of past life regression? Right, like, like did you've been regressed. Yeah, I have a couple of times. It is very okay. real because when you get into uh, when you get into it, you're actually reliving parts sure. of that past life. Yes. And it can be very emotional. I remember in, in, in one case, uh, one of the past lives, I was a, a mother. It was in uh, medieval Europe. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, in, in one scene, my 10 year old daughter had fallen from her horse and she was very badly injured and I was holding her in my arms and the tears were streaming down my cheeks as I was saying goodbye to her. So that, that, and, and, and that happens to a lot of my clients when I regress them is that they can get into a very emotional situation where it might be tears of joy because a baby is born or they got married or whatever, or tears of grief because one of their loved ones passed away. So it's very real and it's very, it actually is very enlightening because a lot of times uh, when people go to a past life and, and in my sessions, the past life is chosen for them by their higher self. So yes. they don't know where they're going and I don't know where they're going. Usually the past life has some relevance to their current life. So there may be somebody in the past life who was an important player, like a spouse, child, parent, who is an important player in their current life. And so that sort of right. makes the connection. Uh, sometimes they will, uh, in the past life, they'll see that there was some, some unfinished business, some unfinished karma that they did not resolve with somebody. Right. And that, that person is now in their current life and they're still knocking heads because they haven't haven't resolved what wasn't resolved. Yes, in the past yes. And, 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 and it really the, plays through to help them. Right. And, and the reason why I say I, I was a hypnotherapist for many years. And I think it's interesting because when you mentioned that thing about karma and past life regression, you know, and I've heard that, you know, I had that same experience where, like you said, the group of people, sometimes it's the same group of people with different roles. Mm -hmm. But sometimes once you resolve, and I don't know if this was your experience, once they, two people resolve whatever it was that was going, it doesn't have to be major. It doesn't have to be, mm -hmm. they resolve it. That's it there. It's almost like each one then can go on and do different things Yep. because they, and, and I want to say even the worst, um, how can I say? relationships for lack of a better word sometimes if they get get it this time then that's it that frees them both um, yeah and in, in a lot of cases uh, you know a, a client will say uh you know i'd like to know why i don't get along with my brother-in-law right and then so they get back re regress or their higher self will tell them well you and your brother-in-law had a past life together and you fought constantly and you never resolved your issues and now that's why you're knocking heads in this life and then most of the time that revelation is sort of like okay now I know how mm -hmm. to resolve this issue with my brother-in-law or mother or father right. or whatever it may be. Uh, so it's, it's very it, it's very helpful because people can then understand why they're having this conflict. And right, they even also, if they can't logically explain it, like yeah, you know how, how you know how you sometimes you'll say I've met somebody and I, either I like them a lot or I just don't know I don't like this person, even though you really don't know anything about them. And sometimes there's something deeper going on there. I mean, sometimes it's instinctual because we're picking up subconsciously on something, but other times it's like you said, there's, there's a past that you just don't realize as to why this person 
well, mm -hmm. triggers you. <laughs> How's that? And on the on the flip side, the, some of my clients have said they they met their spouse sort of like first time they met it was just an instant connection. It was yeah, like I know this person, but they've never met them before. So when you get into the into the session and, I, and you ask the question, I hear yourself says, "Oh, well, you and this person have many past lives together as lovers and spouses." And so mm -hmm. that is that's sort of leaking through. And you saw this person in this life, it was like, "Oh, I." You don't know why you, you you have an instant connection, but that's because of the past life experience. So right there, there's really that, very, that foundation. Very, very enlightening, yeah. Did you ever have that experience where people come in for regression, and they almost are positive? Oh, I know, I lived during whatever you know a certain time period, and then when you actually regress them, they go someplace totally different. You know, because sometimes you have ex. I'm not saying that sometimes whether they were there or not, but you know, sometimes people romanticize certain time periods. Mm -hmm. But then the reality of what, who, or what they, where they were at, when you take them back, they're surprised when they don't go back to that time period. They go to some place really like either you know different sex, a different um, exactly. work place in the world. Like what? I never thought I was because it's because it's that. In, in my sessions, their higher self chooses the past life. Exactly. So even though they think I'd like to go to that past life that I enjoyed in Egypt, ancient Egypt. Sure, and they right. get to go someplace different because their higher self is saying, you don't need to see that scene. You need to see this one. And so sure. they, they have their own reasons. And so so people are sometimes disappointed. But they will ask often in, in, when, they, when we get to the higher self part, they bring with them a list of questions, like very direct mm -hmm. questions, which I will then ask the higher self, okay. the higher self channels through them. So they can say, well, did I have a life in ancient Egypt, uh, you know, living mm -hmm. among the pyramids? And the higher self can say, yeah, you did. And they can they can describe a bit of it, but they don't actually get there in the past life regression because the higher self has other places exactly. for them to go to. Right. So, There's sometimes things that are more important more to what important they're actually experiencing see, yeah. right now. As in, yeah, that life, if, if there was one, it's not going to do anything for you now. Well, you need mm -hmm. to see this one. Exactly. So that you get it, whatever it is. And sometimes I had experiences where I would regress people. And it was a really ordinary life, for lack of a better word. And then when they would come out, I would say, and they would say, they would look at me and they go, I get it. Like something in them clicks. I don't know, for lack of, where mm -hmm. they, there's something about witnessing whatever they did in a very ordinary life. How's that? To somehow make sense no, to no, them exactly and, and in fact the vast majority of of cases uh, this is confirmed by dolores cannon are very ordinary lives mm -hmm. nothing special happened she calls no king, them queen queen nothing lives. like that yeah so if people come into a past life regression thinking well i want to be uh, i want you to show me my life as cleopatra or joan of arc <laughs> or henry the eighth or somebody famous i've never experienced that it doesn't happen you know most of yeah. us have, have very ordinary past lives sure. in fact as humans you now the, the interesting thing is occasionally i've had a client who's had a path who's shown a past life as an alien life form on another planet okay that has happened to me which is really All quite right. interesting but but it, it hasn't come up very often but it, it's really and, and, there's a, How yeah, you... and it, there's a lot of people who have past lives on other planets when you life. when they start going when they start describing wherever it is that whatever they see either see themselves or the place When's your first tip off? Like, okay, we're off planet now. What happened that first time you ever had a regression? That, oh, that, well, that I, I could just tell by when they uh, when they sort of uh, uh, come into the past life regression. Mm -hmm. I asked them to describe uh, their body, what they're wearing, and so on. So you can sort of tell from that if they say, "Yeah, I've got um, I've, I've got wings and feathers." <laughs> okay, you're <laughs> like, oh, you know, it's not a it's not a human. And then they'll describe okay. the environment where they're in, and if it's totally not like Earth, then you know, okay, you're on a different planet. They won't know. They can't tell you what planet it is because mm -hmm. not, you know, when they're living there, they don't know what it is. I mean, like, what do you mean planet? This is my home. I've always been here. You know, right. so they're not aware of it. But you can usually get that information on the second part of the of the uh, session where we contact the higher self and they can say, okay, wh wh why did, did you know why did you show this person this life and where was it? You know, and they can say, well, it was the uh, planet in the Palladian star system, whatever. So you get more sure. information. But when they're in the past life, they don't, aren't capable of understanding uh, what you're talking right, about. Right, right. It's exactly like if, it is. they don't know what planet it is or what country it is because they're not. I think I'm so glad you pointed that out because that would be, I'm not saying they're dogs, but it's like if you dog, asked your dog, what planet are you on? If they could talk, they'd be like, huh? Yeah, you what, know, what, in other what, words. What are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> what are you talking about? What, what do you mean planet? It's This is home. You know, we always think of that wherever, let's say in that, that, that example, 
where it's a different planet that we would have what we understand as far as land masses, you know, planet, mm -hmm. solar system. And there's existences where that doesn't really matter or they don't know anything about that. That's not part of their, their world experience. Yeah, exactly. They, they don't understand what the, what the question is when they're there. Uh, but, mm -hmm. but the higher self can usually fill in a lot of it. I mean, I, for example, I had one um, lady who, who said she always felt like Earth was not her home mm -hmm. and she didn't belong here. And she said when she'd go out at night, she'd look up the stars and, and feel homesick. It was like some something drawing her. Asked the higher self and he said, oh, yeah, well, she's had many, many lives in a uh, planet in the Pleiadian star system. And so she's homesick for that, those previous lives. Okay. And this is maybe her her early incarnations on planet Earth. So the higher self sort of filled in those details that she couldn't uh, right. describe to me because of, you know, she wasn't aware of, you know, planet, what are you talking about? This is where I've always lived, you know? Right. But I imagine then at some point, though, for whatever reason, she decided that she was going to incarnate on this Earth plane versus. Well, yeah, you know, well, absolutely. She, she, she made the decision. Everyone actually has the free choice to decide where to incarnate. So if she'd wanted to stay in the, in the keep on incarnating in, in that planet in the Pleiadian constellation, she could have. But 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 and oftentimes uh, someone in the spirit world will suggest to people that okay, you've had lots of incarnations on this planet, time to try something else because you can get yeah. sort of into a familiar sort of rut and you don't really learn anything, you know. Sure. So, so she yeah. may have been she may have been persuaded to come to planet Earth, but the, the final decision was always hers. And and then so now she is here and she's thinking. She has these residual memories of, of a very nice lives on a different planet. And of course, planet Earth is not a very nice place. I mean, right. Oh, that's how you were. Stuff right. going on. It's, it's a tough school. Dolores Cannon has has referred to the Earth school as the toughest in the universe. I have no idea whether that's true or not. But right. I know it's, it's like we're going to send you out to the school. Wild West. Chat from yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> figure it, it out. It is. Yeah. And in fact, my, my spirit guide, Albert, has said to me many times, every human on Earth should pat themselves on the back for being so courageous as to come to this really tough school. So, well, and it goes to show you pat because yourself in the back, Marley. <laughs> no, I'm telling you, there's times. <laughs> no, there is, you know, because, you know, there's, uh, for all this, the answers that we think we get, there's a lot of unanswered questions about ourselves, you know, what we're, what we're here to do, you know, why, how, when, where. And you described something in your biography, Garnett, about, sounds like parallel universes. Yep. Right. And how did that conversation come about? Was it Albert who talked to you about that? Yeah, I'm not sure how it arose. I think he probably said, uh, yeah, there's there's lots of parallel universes. And and I said, well, is Earth in any of them? And he said, yeah, there's many of them. And so then I said, well, can I can you take me to visit one? So as part of, a, you know, after my initial dialogue with Albert, how I interacted with him was through the astral plane. He would come mm -hmm. into my bedroom, say, come on, we're going on a trip to wherever uh, and okay. we travel astrally so he took me on this one of these trips he took me uh, traveling astrally to a, a one of earth's parallel universes so this is earth uh, um, in a parallel universe but it wasn't exactly the same as our earth and and he said that parallel universes arise when the universe will randomly split into two has been doing this since the beginning just randomly split okay. into two and the two universes initially then will split into two more and, and so on and so forth so now we have a whole bunch of them and so Earth has been in a situation where the universe has split into two. Initially, the two Earths are identical, but then the interaction of energy and matter and, and right. the they actions do something of the, totally the inhabitants different. changes the course of the history. So very interesting. In this first parallel universe I went to, he took me to, uh, we, we dropped down, uh, we were flying through the air, down through the clouds to lower Manhattan. And I could see the, the World Trade Towers were still standing. And I uh -huh. said to him, well, what year is this in this university? He said, well, it's the same as yours, which is well after 9-11. And I said, why are these trade towers still standing? And he said, well, a quirk in the history of this planet was that Muhammad, who, who created and engendered Islam, he died in a freak accident at a very young age. So Islam was never formed. Islam did not exist as a religion on that planet. There were no Islamic terrorists. Hence, the, the world trade towers were still standing. Right. So... I said, well, that's very interesting. I said, I'll show you one more thing about this, this uh, uh, parallel universe. So he took me up uh, Manhattan into Harlem, which is, as you know, the uh, yes. very uh, black neighborhood. We dropped down the street and he said to me, do you notice anything different about this? And I said, well, there aren't very many black people here. There's just a lot of traffic and so on. And I said, why is that? And he said, well, another quirk in the history was that in that, uh, in, in that parallel universe, 
way back in the early days, Great Britain abolished slavery. And then soon okay. the other European countries abolished slavery. So when they colonized the new world, there was no slave trade. They didn't bring any slaves. Right, right. The, the movement, the diaspora from Africa never happened. Never happened. There was no, uh, there was no civil war, no civil rights movement because there was mm -hmm. no need for it. And so the population, the black population of the U.S. and that planet was like less than 1% versus like 13% now. And so it was a very different, very different history. No, I'm not saying that that planet. No, no, no. Better, and this is very I'm not interesting. A value judgment. It's just, it is what it is. And oh, no, it, it absolutely. Has, and but so that was, that was very interesting. And just a couple of little quirks. That, one little, one little change will like a yeah. ripple effect. Exactly. It changes. A ripple effect. Yeah. And so, so that was, uh, that was quite interesting. He, he took me to another one then later. And this is, uh, I think in my fifth book and, uh, and, and it, it, um, it, it, we we went dropped down over LA, and what I noticed was that there was no smog over LA, which is okay. not typical. So I said to him, "What's going on here?" And he said, "Well, in this world, they had a COVID pandemic just like our Earth did, but it, it happened a few years earlier. And during the pandemic, the lockdowns, they noticed that the air was cleaner, uh, mm -hmm. water is cleaner because there's a lot less pollution, not people not moving around. And so when the pandemic was over and the lockdowns were over, their scientists got together to say." We have to try to see if we can't make this a permanent feature, you know, right. of no pollution. So when I when I was hovering over LA, I could see that there was virtually no vehicles on the freeway. I was gonna say, and, and if you've ever been to LA, you know how the freeways are always jammed up with, mm -hmm. with trucks and cars and everything. So the air was clear, uh, uh, basically no pollution. And I said, well, how did this happen? He said, well, they started off with the uh, I can't remember the, uh, the the initials are CRN in in, in Switzerland, the the particle accelerator. They mm -hmm. started off there and they found out a way to basically teleport uh, a, a molecule of water from one place to another. Okay. And then they gradually moved up to other things and, and they got to the point where just like Star Trek, where you could right. go into a yeah, chamber right and, and teleport to another place. And so that means right. he said that, that, that there were no uh, trucks or trains hauling freight around. Uh, people didn't need to drive cars to get around. If you wanted to go from LA to New York, instead of having to uh, drive to the airport, hop on a plane, sit on the plane for, you know, five hours and then get off in New York. You go into a teleportation booth, plug in your coordinates, and like that, you're... Right, and the same thing I imagine for York. cargo, you put it on a platform. Absolutely. Cargo went, people, everything. So there was there was very little fossil fuel pollution in that planet at that stage. They had a much better atmosphere. Uh, their rivers and lakes weren't polluted. And so sure. it was really a nice a, a nice, right. uh, a nice place to live. And, and, he, and I said, well you know can can you tell me what this, their secret is so i can tell our guys back on my earth and he said no can't do that they're gonna have to figure that out for themselves but uh, yeah. it's a very interesting development to show you how uh, uh, exactly a the, the that earth and our earth and, and right, the process can, the process yeah one day maybe we can get there i hope right right and you know what <clears throat> except you know the only thing is unless you watch the movie i don't know if you ever remember that old movie well they did the, the remake of the fly where he's trying to do that same thing and he ends up basically when, you know, when they're working out, like, like you said, basically your, your atoms, your, your molecules are dispersed and they reform yeah. on the other side, you know, and, but you got to make sure that when they reform on the other end, everything goes where it's supposed to. Exactly. Kind of deal. Yeah. It's like, who wants to be the guinea pig on that? It'd be like, ah, I don't know about that. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, it's one that, of those. That, that would be the concern of the first human that was teleported. Oh, absolutely! It'd be yeah. like, so who's gonna, who's a test pilot on this? <laughs> no, it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be me. But <laughs> no, 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 no. It's like, yeah. Well, we've done it on all these, you know, inanimate objects and animals. Mm -hmm. All we got left now is a human. And it'd be like, <laughs> there. And, yeah, and, like, and they kinda... actually use this, this system to to transport uh, people and goods to other planets in our solar system. Now, it, it, it apparently didn't work past the solar system. But it worked within it, so they had all the planets, bases, and all the planets, and and they were doing very well. And, and sure. And so it was something. I I hope that we could get there someday. No, that technology. It's one of those things that yeah, that you always hope that that's going to come about. Mm -hmm. But then I understand the same reasoning of what Albert described, where it's a process that we have to arrive at on our own, as far as thinking it out and well, however it, it is to get there. Yeah, you know. he he said he's not gonna. The, the, the spirit world is not gonna hand us the uh, the, the silver bullet on a platter. I mean, it's, we have yes. to work at it. It's up to yes. us. I mean, they could they could do that, but they're not gonna 
I mean, it's just making it too easy for us. I mean, it's the same, the same reason that, um, you know, we all prepared life plans before incarnated. Mm -hmm. And I'd say to Albert, well, why don't you, why can't I know what's in my life plan? It would be so much easier if I had the step-by-step sure. roadmap as to what I should be doing every day, you know, based upon what I was hoping to achieve. And he said, well, that's too easy. He said, you came here for a struggle to learn. Uh, mm -hmm. He said, if I showed you your life plan, you'd be like a teacher giving her students and uh, the questions and answers to a final exam yeah. before the exam. Like, why bother writing it, you know? So we didn't come it. here think for an easy it. time. We knew what we were getting into, except that once you're here, it's like, my God, what was I thinking? <laughs> it's too late. Well, but but think about it, Garnett. As human beings, I think we're all, what we all look for is a purpose. Mm -hmm. And if we knew oh, you know, this is going to happen to you at this age, you're going to marry this person and you're mm -hmm. going to have these mm -hmm. children or your career is going to do this. And it'd be like, all right, so what's left? You know, it kind of like, as far as, I don't know, as far as my observations of human nature, we need to have a purpose. Yep. In other words, that unknown, that question mark or that freedom of choice as in this mm -hmm. way or that, because if everything was laid out and it was no deviation or hardly any, it'd be like, okay, be yeah. Boring. Oh, uh, yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah, who cares? Yeah, you know, yeah. or the same thing, the opposite that now you always hear people going to fortune tellers, especially for like, Oh, what am I going to pass away? Mm -hmm. And they get an answer that they didn't want to hear. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like, Oh, why did I ask that? And what's really funny, I think is that even if that person that told them this really is not a, it's not a fortune teller. And in the sense of they, they wigs people out. <laughs> To know, hey, I'm going to die when I'm 60 years old or 70 or 40 or whatever. To know that, you know, it plays, it does, not, I think it does a very bad thing to your head. No matter how much you think, I'm not going to believe that. You, you know, and in and, and, and my clients, I've never had anyone who's asked that question sure. for the higher self. And I know that if I asked the question to the higher self, they wouldn't answer it. Right. Because it, it would just throw you off course. I mean, if you, if you know, if you it doesn't matter what time frame, but if the higher self says, "Yeah, you're going to die in two years," well, it would throw your whole life, rest of your life, totally off course. Right, like it's party time or whatever. Yeah, whatever, but you'd miss some of the things that you had wanted sure. to accomplish. So. Sure, yeah, that that question mark of how long we're going to be here, how much time do we have, or the challenge of mm -hmm. accomplishing something. I think that we need that. We need that as far as to make life interesting. How's that? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right, and and uh, so that's that is the big challenge for us is because we don't know what's uh, we don't remember what's in our life plan, and we have free will to act, and so course, that means basically, will. as Albert said, is that you know you can have twenty boxes on your life plan that you want to check off. It's very rare for someone to check them all off in one life, you sure. know. So you, you check off a few of them, go back to the spirit side. You can then regroup and say, okay, well, I'm going to go back into another life and see if I can check off the other boxes, you know. So well, it's really entirely up to us, but we always stray off course. It's, of it's, course. Well, it's it's the flip side of the same coin. Yeah. We have free choice, free will, but the flip side of it is total responsibility for the outcome. And sometimes people shy away from that. Mm -hmm. And I can see where being here and during this lifetime, especially if you're one of these persons that always wants to play it safe. Don't get me wrong. I, I, I understand about self-preservation, but they never go beyond. They never try to push themselves beyond what their comfort zone. You know, they always want to live life too safe. Mm -hmm. And by this, and I'm not people, saying and those people, when they finish and they go through their life, yes. review, they're going to realize, okay, I was playing it too safe. I didn't learn very much. So mm -hmm. now I really should go back and try again. And so that often spurs people onto another incarnation, you know, sure. and I've had so many people say, clients say to me, well, if I have free choice, when I, when I die to go back to spirit side, and not come back to this hellhole, there's no way I'm coming back here. And I say, you have a much different perspective when you're back on the spirit side and you'll sure. look at a life on earth as just a, another adventure, a learning experience that you, nobody's forcing you to do it, but you want to do it. It's just, it's a moral imperative really. Right. Yeah. I, I guess earth is like, we're going to go climb Everest. Oh, okay. Yeah. Again, here we go. You know, like, but yes, I, I can. And I want to say that, when I mention that, I don't mean only physically. It could be somebody that, as far as, let's say, aspirations for themselves, they remain very boxed in in their life choices as far as maybe what they do for work or the life they lead or where they live. They're, they can find themselves. And, of course, they use different excuses not to break out of it. And it doesn't have to be like, hey, you're going to go bungee cord jumping 
it could be that you decide I'm going to go and pursue this career, for example. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, doesn't have to be a physical no, thing. It doesn't have to be. No, but but there's just too many of us, including myself. I often fall into that same trap, like stay within my comfort zone. Oh, of course, yeah. that's the human nature. That's human yeah. nature. And, and thankfully, Albert is there to kick my butt every now and then to say, you got to get out of your comfort zone and go and do this or that, you know? So I'm, I'm thankful for that. Most people, oh. well, we all have spirit guides, except most people's spirit guides aren't as direct in communication as, as Albert was with me. Um, but, uh, you know, our guides are always trying to do the same thing to, to all of us. Um, and Albert doesn't give me any advice on my personal life. So he, okay. he will contact me directly, speak to me, show me things. Uh, to so I could write about him in my books. That's for sort of general application. So if I asked him, you know, what should I do, Albert, uh, next year, or should I change jobs? Should I get have it, buy a different house? He'll say, can't answer that. You have to figure that out for yourself. So in that sense, I'm like everyone else, except I've had this direct contact of general application for principles that, that are applicable to everyone. So that's where I am. He's not going to budge on that. And in fact. It's probably good that he doesn't because I don't think I, I, I say I want to know what's my life plan, but in reality, it wouldn't be a good thing. Let me ask you this from what you're saying. Is Albert the guardian, somebody that's been with you from birth or did he join you at yes. that time when you met him? Yeah, he, he's been with me from, from birth. Um, for most people, we have a number of spirit guides. I have three. I've met another one and another one that they won't disclose to me yet, but our, our spirit guides do change over time. So you, you usually have maybe one who's there from birth to death. Mm-hmm. And, but your other guides will come and go as your needs on your human journey require. And so they will they will change as you go through life. Looking and, and back you, now and, at your life, do you ever think growing up as a child that you either felt, heard, or something about Albert before that day that you met him as a homeless man? Never. Not that I'm aware of. I mean, I'm sure he okay. was there. And I'm sure mm-hmm. he was probably sending me messages, but I was just oblivious. Right. So I didn't know no, no awareness of him at all until he stopped me on the street that day. Right. And the reason why I ask is that I know sometimes people will have dreams, really weird dreams having to do with guardians before they have an actual, you know, in our dreams, they speak to us in symbols. And mm-hmm. sometimes when we see somebody that we really don't know, like, I don't know that person, but sometimes it's, you know, they're trying to come in through our dreams. So we kind of like get it. But we mm-hmm. many times we dismiss it as, man, I, I shouldn't eat that before I go to bed, you know, whatever they ate for dinner. So I was just wondering if he had tried to communicate with you before that moment. Well, he may have, but I wasn't aware of it. And you so, weren't aware of it. Yeah. So he, it. he was probably sending me subtle messages all the way through my life and I wasn't getting it. So then he had to take the bull by the horns and stop me yeah. in a physical <laughs> form. I'm tired of tapping you on the shoulder. You're not paying attention. You know, exactly. Yeah, totally. <laughs> You know, so and, and when he, when you're he, like um when does he like do you do you communicate with him on a daily basis weekly monthly or only when you're writing a book how does that work well it varies like in the first while it would be sort of uh, at least on a weekly basis mm-hmm. um and then when i'm writing the book he's there more more uh, more often he, he doesn't tell me what to write but he gives me some direction um and then okay. now you know, it, it's not a daily thing. It's if I have a question or want to ask him something, I'll uh, I just sit quietly in a in, in a room and go into light meditation and ask him, and he'll he'll he's always there. He always shows up. I mean, he's always there twenty four seven, even though I, I'm not speaking to him. Mm-hmm. Just like our guides are, they're always there. Right. Um, so yeah, he's still in my life, and I'm I'm just waiting for him to tap me on the shoulder to say, okay, let's go off on another trip because I want you to write book six. So <laughs> have you ever done any any orders. remote viewing? Have you ever done any remote viewing? No. No? Okay. And I know that, you know, for people that practice meditation often, remote viewing comes easier for them uh, as far as being able to, like, you know, do what, you know, go to another place and maybe have a bird's eye view of certain locations and things like that. Mm -hmm. Was there... um, Is there any point that... Have you ever said no to Albert? <laughs> How's that? Have you ever said no? I don't well, want to do that. I'm not, not going not to a, do not that. A, a firm no, but but a, a showing reluctance, especially yeah. the first book. Is I'm like, well, I don't, Albert. I don't want to write a book. I don't. I've never written a book. Don't know how to write a book. So why why are you telling me to do this? So I was dragging my feet. I never okay. said no totally. 
but I was dragging my feet and he just, he's a very gently persuasive. And I since learned now after the first mm -hmm. book that if he suggests I do something, I don't bother trying to argue with him. I just do it. So I've learned yeah. that because you can't, you know, spirit is going to win. Even if you dig your heels in, eventually they will win. Okay. And has your, I know you mentioned that you said your wife has had her own experiences. This was prior to you having this. Yes. Has she met her own spirit guide or has anything happened to her parallel to you? No, not that, no, not that I'm aware of. If she has, she hasn't told me about it. And I think she probably would have. Uh, mm -hmm. So her, her experiences uh, happened before I met Albert um, and they related to uh, having her father who had just died appear in her life. Okay. And, and the same thing with her mother. And so she, uh, so she's quite aware of, of what's going on, but she ha hasn't mentioned about her spirit guide. And I'm, I know that they're they're with her all the time too, but they've chosen not to be uh, in direct communication with her. Right, for whatever reason. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I understand that. So what do you think as far as, when you look back, how's the, you know that when you say the before and the after, right? Before you met Albert and after. What has, what do you think, let's house for this. If you would not have met Albert that day, or you would have met him, but you would have walked around and said, oh, this smelly guy, get out of my way. Mm -hmm. What do you think would have happened to you in your life? Besides obviously writing the books, what do you think, what, how's that one moment, you know, where you go down that route, what would have been different for your life? What do you think? You would have kept working. Well, I, would have been, I would have been the same kind of uh, arrogant, condescending <laughs> lawyer, okay. non-spiritual. I would have been, mm -hmm. you know, I would have been going, going on the same track. I can only hope that if I had gotten, I hadn't spoken to Albert that day, that he would have come back sometime later, maybe okay. in a different form uh, and, and to transform my life. I, like, I don't think that, I don't think he would have given up that easily, although he hasn't mm -hmm. committed to saying that he would have, but it, um, I, hopefully he would have done that. Cause I think it was, I mean, he he said that he and I planned this incarnate uh, this okay. encounter before I incarnated. Okay, so on the spirit side, I'm doing my life plan, and he said that he and I planned to meet. I never remembered that, of course, but it was all okay. planned. It was an accident. Um, and uh, in point of fact, Albert and I have had uh, a few incarnations on Earth together as humans. So we've had some past experience lives together, um, and he reminded me of some of those. I've, I, I've had a glimpses of a few of them. Um, so he's he's been with me. He's had his own car incarnations on planet Earth, and so okay. when I when I was doing my life plan, I don't know whether I asked him to be one of my guides or he volunteered. Don't remember that, but he ended up being one of them. And, and then he and I planned to uh, to have that encounter. And I said to him, "Why did you pick me to to uh -huh. write your books?" And he said, "Well, he said I have a lot of messengers. You're just one of them." And he said, "We uh, we thought that you." because you've had some past lives where you've had some experience writing, we thought you might be mm -hmm. a good candidate to write some books. So that's, that's why we picked you. Of course, he could have been dead wrong. I mean, I could have, I, I could have just been a lousy as a, as a book writer, but he yeah. took a chance and, and he, sure. you know, he showed up in my life. And so, so he's a human history, soul. He's not right. like an angelic being. And you know, because you, know, you always hear about guardian angels, but what you're describing is a human soul. Who's a guide yes. who has actually incarnated on yeah. this plane. Okay. He has. Yeah, yeah, right. he has. So he's he's got a lot of hands-on experience about life on Earth as a human. Uh, so he's an excellent guide. He he knows exactly what's what I'm going through, what other humans are going through, and so he's he's been a great source of wisdom because he's had that experience. If you never okay. incarnated as a human or anything on planet Earth, you wouldn't be quite as knowledgeable about sure. what's coming up or how you should deal deal with it. Yeah, what's that saying about walking in somebody's shoes? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, when do you think, um, how's, how about, um, incarnating as, as animal life? Have you had any experiences or has he told you, or have you had any experiences with any of your, of your clients with that? I'm sorry, any experience with incarnating which? with as animals? Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. He, he, he totally confirmed that to me. Um, I said early on in my conversation at one point, I, we were talking about souls. I said, so do animals have souls? And he said, you need only look into the eyes of your little dog to find your answer. So he was saying, yes, animals have souls. Oh, yeah. uh, some of my clients have had past lives as animals. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So it does happen. Uh, you and I may have had past lives as animals. Don't know. I mean, okay. uh, you know, and I've had some 
clients say, well, if, if, if souls can incarnate as animals, there's no way I want to come back as an animal. And I said, well, it's your free choice. But usually souls who are new to the earth plane, a lot of times they will start off with a, a animal incarnation because it's much simpler. I mean, if you're if, if you're a rabbit, you don't have to worry about uh, a career, mortgage payments, saving for retirement, sure. putting your kids through college. You know, very simple life as a rabbit. Where's my next meal and how do I avoid eating by an eagle? You know, sure. whereas human lives are incredibly complex, as you know. Yes, so yes. oftentimes souls will start off with simple lives and then graduate up to a human life. So um, you don't have to, nobody has to worry about somebody's going to force me to come back as a snake. It doesn't happen. Right, right. And that's I think that that's the important thing that you're not forced into something. That it's a choice that you make. Yep. Freely, maybe from a different vantage. You know, how's uh, just like when, you know, we have children, we take them to the doctor and they don't want to go. But, you know, you have to do it because you have a different perspective on it. Yes. You know, that kind of deal. So, yeah, I, I understand it's free choice, but you have knowledge that enables you to look at the situation differently. Absolutely. Yeah. Then you do. Yeah, you have you're... a much different perspective as a soul. Oh, absolutely. The side because, you know, we think that uh, because there's no linear time on the spirit side, there's no past or future, just one big now. So for them, a lifetime, a human lifetime of 80 years on Earth is just the blink mm -hmm. of an eye over there. So it's like, you, you know, you know, it's going to be a tough life on Earth. Um, but it's, it's sort of like, well, it's going to be over very soon. So who cares? And I hope to learn a lot. I hope to grow and evolve as a soul by incarnating. And so, you know, it's just like, why do people decide to run a marathon and nobody's forcing them to? Sure. They, they want to face the challenge. Exactly. Exactly. It's surpassing what, whatever, whatever metric it is that you have that yeah. in your mind, you know, it could be like me, a 5k, which is 3.191 miles. That's not much, but for somebody <laughs> who doesn't do much, that's like, I did a 5k. Yay. You know, yeah. and then you have people who have done like those marathons and things like that. It's like, all right, yeah, I know my limitations, but yes, it's that overcoming the uh, the achievement. How's that? The ability yeah, you to want achieve. You, you want the satisfaction of achieving something that you are striving towards, and and, and so you know, a, a, an incarnation on planet Earth is the same way. It's like, okay, can I handle the obstacles I built for myself in my life plan? Can I handle it? Uh, okay, or am I going to just? Uh, you know, t turn to the negative emotions and, and go off course. What am I going to do? You know, and, and so it's a challenge. You want to say, yeah, I can handle that. I can I can pick out a life plan that that, that gives me growth and evolution without uh, turning negative and becoming a serial killer or sure. a, you know, a, a child abuser or whatever the other bad things are. You mm -hmm. know, so that mm -hmm. it's a challenge. And, and we freely accept that challenge, knowing that we could go off course. But then, you know, you can come back to this planet as many times as you want. So there's no end. There's no end. It's like you graduate from planet Earth when you feel like you have, and you're the one who decides that. As far as I know, you mentioned that about clients that have described basically incarnating as extraterrestrials. We'll put them because they're on another planet. Has Albert or any of your clients talked about extraterrestrials coming here or being here on Earth? Absolutely. In fact, he's. Uh, He's taken me to, uh, yeah, he's talked about it. Uh, he says that there's a number of very advanced ET races that have been visiting Earth for the longest, for centuries. And their their craft are basically the UFOs that are reported, you know. So when they want, uh, they, they can, they, when they choose to be seen, they allow themselves to be seen. But there's, mm -hmm. there's several different races. They're very advanced. They're all benevolent. He says, you know, you, you can read some of these conspiracy theories about, you know, reptilians or other evil Races right. trying to take over Earth. He says that's nonsense. He says they are so advanced that they wanted to take over Earth and enslave humans. They could have done so eons ago. They're here to help right. us. They're they're watching what's going on. They want to help us, but they can't directly interfere. So, right. for, for example, their 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 technology. They could just wipe out all of our new nuclear and biological and chemical weapons. They could just get rid of them all. They're not allowed right. to do that. They have to let us. Uh, you know, it's again going back to Star Trek. It's like the, the prime directive, the prime directive. Which is they're not allowed to interfere with an inferior civilization. They have to let it develop naturally. And so they're sort of watching what's going on. They send us intuitive messages to help us with some of our technology, but they can't just march in and say, okay, all your weapons are gone. You guys are now living in peace. Yeah, before you guys blow each other up and the planet as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. Exactly. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so there are uh, races that are uh, observing us. They even took me into one of the their spacecraft that was orbiting Earth uh, okay. you know, on one of my astro trips, and there was uh, you know humanoid creatures, 
and th they basically uh, uh, confirmed what he said was that, yeah, we're watching what's going on. We want you guys, meaning human race on Earth, to succeed. Uh, and But we're limited in terms of what we can do. So we're monitoring what's going on. And in fact, uh, there's been more and more observation from uh, other ET races after we split the atom in World War II. Because that yes. was like a signal to them. Okay, so these guys down there on Earth, they've learned how to split the atom. So we better pay more attention to them. Because once you split okay. the atom, of course, you can destroy your planet. Uh, so right. anyway, they've been watching us. and uh, uh, Right, yeah, you were advancing before it was, yeah. It was like, okay, the worst they can have is a fist fight. All right. Just yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. Yeah, and then after that, it's guns and artillery and so on. Exactly. You kill people, not so many. Once you can split the atom or fuse the atom in a nuclear bomb, then that's 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 really, you can destroy all life on your planet for sure. And so that, that was sort of a red flag for them. Like, okay, we're going to watch what these earthlings are doing on Earth um, because um, we, we want to try to help them. But you know what? I'm glad you mentioned something about free choice because I've come across, Garnet, and I don't know if you have too, or sometimes people think that the extraterrestrials are going to come at the 11th hour and rescue us from our bad choices. <laughs> and they can't. They, they I don't think, they, they like I think you, that's, they can't. that we yeah. shouldn't do that because that's like, I'm not going to really worry about it because the ETs are going to save us. <laughs> it's like, I, you shouldn't think of it that way no, because no, that's like, um, like a, just releasing yourself from all responsibility as to what happens with us. And, but I know there's a lot of people out there that think that the ETs will never let it get really bad. You know, they're going to come in and like the cavalry and say, okay, don't do that anymore. And, you know, and it's like, no, 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 that's too easy. You know, yeah, yeah. the only time that they can actually take some concrete action, according to Albert, is that the, if we are in danger of actually just destroying our whole planet, then they can right. try to do something to stop us. But other than that, they can't, they can't stop our wars, our murders, our genocide, our all the right. other stuff that's going on. But if we got to the point where we we're actually about to destroy our planet, they could step in and stop that. So I don't want to get to that stage, though, frankly. Sure, sure. You know, when a lot of people say, and you know, you unfortunately, be, fortunately or unfortunately, depends on how you want to look at it, you know, with the media, instant media, we were exposed to so much news about, like you said, murders and, you know, killings and catastrophes. And we always think that's never been this bad. And I say, you know what? I beg to differ. There was a time that human life was not as important as it is now. There was times historically where there was wholesale slaughter of people for different reasons, wars, you know, hey, we're going to burn down, pillage the village and, you know, kill everybody that we don't take. Human life, for all that we see, has never meant as much as it does now. The individual, how's that? Yeah, Even no, we still right. got a way to we, go. We have progressed, say, from where we were 500 years ago, yeah. for sure. We have become more civilized, more empathetic, more caring about our yes. fellow humans. but. There's still a lot of problems there, so we have a long oh, way sure. to go. And what we need yeah. is to have more people like you, Marlene, going on the airwaves and uh, and telling people that we really have to embrace embrace love, compassion, and forgiveness. That's our sure. that's our way out of all the troubles that we have. But of course. there's too many people on our planet who let their negative emotions uh, run their lives, like fear, anger, hate, greed, lust for power. Exactly. You know, that's the biggest problem. But wow. we need to have more and more people tune into yours. Your, your show. Well, you and, know and realize what? that, hey, we have to change our ways. I, you know, and, and, um, you know, and I, uh, and I tell everybody because everybody, I tell everybody, nobody's ever, no, nobody's saying don't get angry. Anger, anger serves its purpose. You understand what I'm saying? Sometimes the anger will spur you to say, oh, I'm not going to settle for this. You know, it'll spur you forward. I think the problem is when you have these people that they dwell in it, they, they, they never get off the angry car. You know, yeah, you, let's say something happens, you get angry, and it's normal. It's a human mm -hmm. response. It's, it has its its purpose, but they never stop. They just, they're always simmering. How's that? Yeah, right? no, I, understand, I understand totally. That's one of the one of the problems. I mean, you're right. Emotions, um, anger, you know, hate, greed, and so on, they're quite natural. The real challenge is that when you feel the anger welling up is that you try to stifle it. Yeah, sure. And or maybe, you know, run. dissect it. Yeah, and it um, your life, yeah. Or get over it. <laughs> get exactly. over it. Yeah. Get over it. Go home. You know, whatever. And and because and and I don't know if you, there's people that will be angry. They're getting over the anger, and they they talk themselves right back into it. They replay, let's say, certain experiences in their head. And what people don't realize is that what you see in your mind, your body thinks is actually happening. You get the release of cortisol, 
And then basically you pump yourself up. So th these are the people that are always angry all the time. You know, they're either mm -hmm. hot or hotter. There's no in between. Yeah. They never let themselves go, whether it's the sadness, anger, all the negative emotions. They, they want to like, they keep it fresh. How's that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they never get beyond it. And we're going to use another Star Trek analogy. You know, Mr. Spock, how he was anti-emotion. Yes. It, well, up to a certain point, he was kind of right in the sense of that logical or better outcomes are done when you try to be a little bit less emotionless. As is, mm -hmm. You know, you've heard that saying, don't make a decision when you're really angry kind of thing, yep. mm -hmm. because it always turns out that later on, you might think, what was I thinking of? Exactly. You just very drastic or stupid things that have far reaching consequences. But yeah, that's, that's one of the things, uh, what is that, you know, to thy own self be true as far as how well, you know, yourself um, to pull yourself out of those feelings of, like I said, either anger and again, same thing with the sadness thing. And I don't, I'm not talking about depression or somebody that needs a, you know, something where they need to see a doctor. I'm talking about people get sad. It's the human condition, mm -hmm. but at some point you got to like start climbing out of it. Yeah, so, exactly. and, and that's one of the things that our humans are settled with is their emotions. Sure. You know, exactly. I mean, we're not, if we were all uh, uh, Mr. Spock, I mean, we'd have a much exactly. happier place to live in, but we're not, you know. And right. So and even he, he had a battle. He was half human. So he was always, even though he tried to act really cool, he was always having to like, you know, uh, you know, battle against his human side. I, you know, that's what makes us humans, I guess, for lack yeah, of a better absolutely. word. Yeah. And, 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 and we have to live with it, but we, but we have to learn to control it. And that's our real test. Yes, it is. It is. It is. It is. It is for negative emotions and uh, embrace love, compassion, and forgiveness. And then if we get there, boy, we'll have a very happy place on planet earth, but of course. we have a long way of to go. Course. Yes. Of course. And there's always going to be challenges. There's always mm -hmm. going to be, People who are nicer, people who are angrier, people, psychopaths. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, there's a whole variety, like I said. And it comes back to what, you know, incarnating or living or existing here. That's the whole reason why you end up here to begin with is because there are, these these are the challenges. Exactly. All right. So, you know, maybe what, when you get. So let me ask you, has Albert ever said, and is it this, the regular I want to say the regular, the normal belief that you hear about that as far as reincarn reincarnation, basically there comes a point that if you have learned all your lessons, that's it. You can if you want to, but you don't have to keep reincarnating. What is it? You become a guide or what happens? It, it, it's up to each soul. I mean, you can, if you decide that you've had enough of their school, you've graduated. Well, mm -hmm. there's so many other places in our universe that you can incarnate different planets, different life forms. Okay. Or yeah, if you wanted to stay in the spirit side, you can, and yeah, you can you can spend the rest of eternity as a spirit guide. So it's everyone's choice, um, and and a lot of people will just uh, you know they'll have a soldier in on the spirit side for a while, and then decide, well, okay, I'd I'd like to go back onto the physical planes again. So I'll pick a planet somewhere where they have interesting yeah. life forms, different challenges, and away I go. So every soul is different. Yeah. Let me ask you, are you working on a book right now? You were saying something about writing another book? Not, not yet, but I'm, ex I'm expecting <laughs> I'm, it. I'm sorry, I'm, push, I'm pushing you. Tap me on the shoulder and say, okay, get at it, Buster. <laughs> Hasn't right, happened yet. Exactly. So I'm, I'm enjoying my time off until he gives me my marching orders. Okay. Okay. So let me ask you your books, uh, just from a podcast listeners. What's your website and where can they find your books at Garnet? My website, website is garnetschulhalzer.com. Uh, not easy to remember how to spell that, but if you if you Google any of my book titles like Dancing on a Stamp, you can get to it. So mm -hmm. on my website, best place for information, there's uh, descriptions of all my books. Uh, there's uh, uh, links to all my social media sites. Um, all my radio shows and podcasts I post on my website. So this one eventually, when I when you send me the link, will be up there, so yes. they can get uh, they can listen to all my uh, radio shows and YouTube videos mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, it, and my email address is there. If somebody wants to send me a comment or a question, I welcome it. It's, it's contact at garnetschulhauser.com. So website is the best place for it. I also have a QHHT website, which is separate. And if okay. people want to book a session there, they can there, just go That's there what I was going to ask about, yes. Yeah, they can just they can uh, get some more information about QHHT. There's a place they can just click on it to book an appointment. So it's very easy. So 
Right, because will, now you can do it remotely, people. like 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 the like a video chat kind of format. I'm sorry. Can do you do the sessions like video chat kind of format? Yeah, I I do uh, I I do a, a version of the session called BQH Beyond Quantum Healing, which can mm -hmm. be done remotely using Zoom. I've done a lot yes. of those. QHHT, according to Dolores Cannon, her mandate was it has to be done in person. So that only works if somebody's in your city. Uh, because, sure. You know, I, and I, you know, I have a, many clients all over the place. Someone who calls from Florida and says, "Hey, I want to have a session." Well, I'm not going. I have no plans to go to Florida. They're not coming here. So then we exactly. do a BQH session by Zoom, which works very well. Sure. Sure. Really. And if you understand the the processes of intention and everything, really, the 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 distance it does it's not a factor it shouldn't no. matter no no it works quite well when i've done uh -huh. uh, you know quite a few of them and it works well and it's it's not a not a problem not quite as nice as being in the sure. same room with the with the client and having a conversation and doing the the, the hypnosis there but it, it works just because it, it, it you know when you're far apart there's no other answer to it let me tell you something many years ago i want to say this real quick many years ago i was being interviewed this was as a matter of fact this was right before this podcast kind of thing it's this was maybe around 2008 i was being interviewed on a show <laughs> and we were talking about hypnosis and everything and i hypnotized my host and he uh -oh. fell asleep and he started snoring oh no <laughs> and I'm, i start getting a call from the engineer who's in another state mm -hmm. the engineer for the show is going oh my god what am i doing I, like he's thinking what this guy's gonna float away i go don't worry he'll snap out of it you know, he'll come out of it. But all of a sudden, you know, I'm relaxing him. I'm relaxing him. And the next thing he hears, you know. That's, that's hilarious, Marlene. <laughs> I, I love that. <laughs> and it was like, but when that engineer called me, he was in a panic. Like, okay, he's like sleeping beauty. He's falling asleep and he's not coming back. And I said, don't worry, he'll snap out of it. It's because I was like, you know, and I'm sure like everything else, what happens with a relaxation with hypnosis is that if, if you're tired to begin with, it, you'll go, you'll go under all right. You keep mm -hmm. going but uh yeah uh as far as the testimony as far as the the distance it doesn't matter you can mm -hmm. it still works it still works it absolutely works yeah anyway it has been absolutely wonderful to speak to you garnet i want to wish you the best of luck on all your projects it's been great to speak to you about everything and again i'm going to have a link to your website on the credits of the show mm -hmm. for anybody that wants to go over and they can find your books it, like you said the best place is to go to your website Mm -hmm. And from there, they can follow the links to whatever it is that they're looking for. Exactly. Yeah. And and uh, thank you for inviting me on your show, Marlene. I enjoyed speaking with you. On the contrary. Host. It's and, been my and, pleasure. Uh, yeah. And I hope you can continue with your show because you're yes. doing a great job. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. And I hope to come back. I'll keep an eye. I keep an eye on all my, my past guests and I bring them back on and we catch up because basically that's what we do. We catch up with what's happening mm -hmm. and, you know, look to see, you know, a lot of interesting things. So, yeah. But of course, we'll, we'll be in touch and I'll keep an eye out as far as uh, any okay. anything happening with you. Okay? Please do. Yeah. Look forward Take to care. it. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Wow. He, you know what? I love speaking to another hypnotist. <laughs> I, can't, I can't lie. I, I really like speaking to another hypnotist because they get it. They get it. Like I said before in other shows, you know, people that don't understand hypnosis or have never experienced it, they have a total misconception of what hypno hypnosis does. All right. Doesn't you don't go anywhere. You don't go into the hypnosis and never come out. You know, like this person's there forever and ever. It's like, no, you, you. let's put it this way. If I hypnotized you and I relaxed you so much and I said, I want you just to relax, go down, 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 deep relaxation and you're there and you kind of like, I'm not kidding that that snoring thing. I even had people that will snore. They're not really asleep, but they were really deep in hypnosis. They'll even do a little bit of snoring. If I just walked away and I left you there, you will eventually like wake up like, huh? Okay. It's not like you don't have to have somebody come and tell you, Hey, wake up. You know, if you're doing the hypnosis, obviously you want to bring the person out of a hypnotic trance. You do, you know, <laughs> you bring them up because, Worst case scenario, nobody disappears into the never never because somebody put you under hypnosis and they just left you there. Um, and he, like I said, he, you know, with the regression, you know, I had a lot of people that asked me, do you believe it? I said, I've seen results of people that have had past life regression where they've 
experienced something during that regression that changed them or answered a question they had. So in other words, I've seen positive results because of it. And so as far as it being real, the results are real. You know, as far as, and this is for the people that say, well, if I'm going to believe something, you, you know, you need to produce results, something tangible, something solid, I guess, or something that we could reproduce, let's say in a lab. And you really can, you know, and I'm sure everybody's heard about these stories, about these children that have had, um, that will remember prior lifetimes and that there's a way to check it out. And this is one of the things I want to, for all the, what he was talking about, I, I take it back. I, I think just about every client I had that regressed was nobody famous. A lot of times they really didn't even have a name that you could check historical records because we keep thinking that records as far as uh, accountability, this, that's a very modern thing in human history. You know, before, depending where in the world or what time period people were born and died, and you were lucky if somebody made an entry into let's say church records, or maybe they did have a city hall. And good luck, you know, those those places sometimes burnt down, floods. In other words, records were very difficult. And um, and unless uh, you had, a, I don't even want to say famous, something happened that you were like, I don't know, you wrote a book or something. Bottom line, the majority of the book of people live their lives in anonymity, right? In the sense of it's very difficult to ever go back and verify, did this person really exist? It can be done, but it's, it just, be, in other words, even if you, let's say, even if you had a name and you said, I'm going to look for this person's name, hoping that they have a, an unusual name, all right? Just because you didn't find them doesn't mean they didn't exist. It could just have been that there was no reason for them to re be recorded anywhere. Or if there was any records, those records, for whatever reason, have disappeared. So a lot of that, that thing about proving, you know, the reincarnation or memories of reincarnation. And then you'll get another theory that says that that reincarnation or regression, how's that? Um, basically, what we're remembering is lives in parallel universes in other words um it's all happening at the same time i mean we could that's a big deep rabbit hole there but that there's not a multiple cycle of lives or experiences on this plane as we know it you know that kind of deal um it's very interesting to prove it one way or the, the other like i said sometimes you've heard of people that a child or even as an adult will recall certain events, names, locations that they had no way of knowing and they do and they produce it and it is a way to verify it. Then you'll say, hey, this person maybe was pulling information, Akashic records, which is an overlay of, all, of human consciousness. Or you'll have another school that will say that we have some type sometimes some type of genetic memory within ourselves that it's not um us living that life what we're experiencing is basically a a lifetime or as one of our ancestors remember our ancestors could be because people say well you know you you do the regression and you could be male or female yeah of course you know maybe our ancestor, if we're going in with that theory, was the man or the woman and whatever their experience was. I mean, that's another theory that people say that, that what we have is genetic memories is what we're seeing or experiencing. I don't know. It's, an, it's, it's a very interesting thing. Um, I would suggest anybody that ever is thinking, read up on it so you don't get so scared. And if you're going to go have somebody do it, do go with a hypnotist who has experience with past life regression. The reason I say this is there's a lot of hypnotists out there that work with like stop smoking, behavior modification, memory retention, weight control, healthy habits, blah, blah, blah. But mm, 
or the regression thing. A lot of them stay away from it on purpose, by the way. Uh, or if they do have experience with it, you want to go to a hypnotist that does regression a lot. They know how to handle, how to put different people with different suggestibilities. They know how to put them under. They know how to steer you the right way. Um, and, and I will say this caveat. Yes, sometimes, depending also on the on the person's suggestibility, some people go under more than other. When I say they go under, they they experience things more viscerally instead of being more of the observer. They're actually there, and sometimes, especially like when he said, when you when you give instructions, like what is the most appropriate lifetime for this person to see? Sometimes you get taken to a very difficult lifetime, including up to horrific deaths. And if you have a hypnotist that is not well-versed in pulling you back into an observer mode, you will have people that kind of wig out a little bit. Okay, imagine, let's say you when we go to the theater now and we're in a really good movie and the music's pounding and we're there, we're living it, we're and we see something that's upsetting and we're like, now, can you imagine if you're having that experience like firsthand, like if you were plunged into that role, um, <clears throat> if that ever happens, because it can happen sometimes, not because, how's this, not because of a mistake, because for some reason you needed to see that, okay? You'd still need a hypnotist who can pull you back into observer mode you're still going to see it, but that first hand, it's happening to me as we speak, will lessen. All right. And if you have a hypnotist that doesn't know how to do that, you know, people wig out a lot, you know, crying, thrashing. Ah, they almost start like, um, you know, like when you dream that usually you, you can't move your body or talk. All of a sudden, and you know, you've heard of people sleepwalking or talking or like basically their, their, their bodies acting with what's going on in their head, the same thing happens. Okay. The people start acting, reacting based on what they're seeing inside themselves in that lifetime, especially, and let's face it, what sticks out is dangerous or stuff that happens that, that shakes you. It's not like, Hey, we were out in the pasture watching the cows kind of thing. Uh, usually some type of scene that's very emotional that will make people react that way. So yeah, again, if you've ever considered doing regression, go to somebody, a hypnotist that is well-versed in regression, you know, do the due diligence on that so that you could have a good experience. And like I said, I had, I had clients who would regress and they would have this, whatever, they would have a review of this lifetime and they would come out of it and they'd be like, they'd be shocked because first of all, it was very real. Okay. But then they would say, I, I, I don't get it. I don't understand why I saw that. It was really unexpected, but I don't get it. Then a week, two weeks, sometimes I would get 15 days. I would get a call back from them or an email or something and say, I think I get it. I think I understand it. They would ever have weird dreams or just something all of a sudden bloomed in their head that all of a sudden they understood why they had seen that particular scene or that lifetime. And by the way, sometimes when you do the past life regression, depending on the, on the, I'm really on what the instructions are. Sometimes you see a whole lifetime because that's one thing that the hypnotist can speed you along, especially if it's like this real normal kind of lifetime, or you'll visit the most momentous part of the lifetime, whatever. There's a reason. And then, Sometimes there's a delay in the, ah, I get it moment. So yeah, don't, don't think that all of a sudden there's going to be, you know, you're going to do the regression. You're going to see a certain lifetime or see a certain experience. And then there's going to be a clap of thunder. You go, hallelujah. I get it now. Sometimes you do. Sometimes it takes a bit for that moment to hit you. Why? Believe it or not, sometimes it talks to you about something in your life that you really yourself logically, consciously have, don't want to face. As a matter of fact, that's why you see it. And that's why you have people that are like, I don't get it. I just, why did I see that? It doesn't make any sense to me. I'm like, 
okay, it'll make sense because there might be something going on with them that they themselves consciously do not want to face, don't want to deal with, are afraid of doing, God. And they have this block up. And it takes them a while to come around and like, you know, what's that saying? Everywhere you go, there you are. Same thing. You can go and be in denial about this aspect of your life, whatever it might be. But eventually it's, well, it doesn't catch up to you. It's, it's always there. So yeah, that's another thing about uh, the weird way that the, the regression works in some instances. So guys, I hope you like this show with Garnet. Super interesting. His link to his website will be on the credits of the show. Again, don't forget to go to mppelliser.com. You're going to find links to everything there, including signing up for my Substack newsletter, where I send uh, articles, links to podcasts, old uh, older videos, which are just as interesting. And again, any news about books, giveaways, that's where you're going to find it. So until next time, thank you so much for spending this time with me and you are all wonderful. Take care.